Hi, I'm the Brewmaster. Welcome to the Blind Eternity's Tavern. Today, I want to talk about politics. And I know other people have discussed how to interact with other players at the table. When you're playing a four-player game like Commander, there's bound to be some deals that are struck. Some conversations had about missing land drops and woe is me. But I think politics actually begins well before that point. Politics can begin before you even select a commander. Politics at the table begins when you decide how you want your deck to play, what you want it to do, and what your goals for that deck are. I want to talk about politics from a deck construction perspective. If that sounds interesting, pull up a chair, have a seat at the table, and whether you're a button mash, hack and slash controller bash, or a meeple moving mastermind of maps, mats, and minis, if you ruffle at the awful riffle shuffle scuffle, or if you're a click clack pick attack number ball luck sack, we're all here for the same reason. I'm Jay. Let's talk games. Now, I want to begin the conversation around politics at the table with what I call a tale of two decks. See, when I first heard about Commander as a format, it was still fairly early, maybe 2009, 2010, it was still getting rolling, there were no pre-cons. And so when I was invited to play at a Commander night, I think the first deck that I built was Sapling of Kolfner. Now, Sapling is a green-black Golgari Commander with a very simple set of abilities. See, Sapling is a 2-5 indestructible. She's also a tree folk, which can be nice for some synergies, although I don't believe I use any in the deck. And her second ability allows you to sometimes, when she attacks, get another creature off the top of your deck. It's handy, sometimes. It's not particularly threatening, it's not particularly powerful. But I saw this as an opportunity to build a deck around Indestructible. Because when you're playing with that many players, I learned this from lunch table games, board wipes abound. It's very difficult to keep creatures in play. And having some things with Indestructible means you can recover a little bit faster. Now over the years, I've made a lot of updates to the deck and changed kind of what it does, but I've always kept that Indestructible theme. On top of that, it has a heavy graveyard recursion but what's unique about this deck is that it's not good, per se. It doesn't have a lot of powerful cards, it doesn't generate a lot of value. It sits like a lump on a log, tree folk pun, and it plays out big creatures. The black cards in the deck are to bring back those big creatures. We have a lot of graveyard interactions and ways to keep things moving back into the deck and back into your hand and back into play, so you can constantly recover no matter what your opponents are doing. And this deck has a surprisingly high win rate, even at some very competitive tables. Not CEDH by any means, but it has beat decks way above its weight class. And I want to walk through specifically what this deck does, but first, I want to look at a second deck. This is a deck that I built fairly recently, and this deck is a rebel deck. It's helmed by Lin Sivy, Defiant Hero. I'm using the new version, but for years I used the old version. I've said before that I started playing during Mercadian Masks, and this was my first competitive deck. It's the first deck that I built from the ground up, trying to actually make it good. Now, Lin Sivy has what looks to be a very powerful ability. She can pay three mana and put any rubble from your graveyard under your library, so anything that dies, she can recycle. Then she can pay any amount of mana to search your deck for a rubble of that mana cost or lower. So she also has some of that same graveyard recursion. She can tutor for creatures and put them directly into play. If she were any other creature type, she would be broken. But Wizards has been very careful to make sure that Rebels never go unpunished. There are very few good Rebels, and so the deck relies more on the support system around it. And unless you're able to get some artifact in play that either makes everything all creature types, Maskwood Nexus, very cool, or something that allows you to search for other creatures, your win condition is essentially get a lot of small Rebels into play, and then search for a... Uh, 
something that buffs them up and allows you to maybe attack for a lot of damage. There's not a lot of ways to win the game. The benefit of the Tree Folk deck is when you do bring things back from the graveyard, they're 7-7s, seven 8-8s. Seven, eight eight. They deal a lot of damage, but most of the Rebels are 3 power or less. And given the time period that they were printed, they're also just bad from a vanilla perspective. The mana costs are too high for what the cards do. I say a lot of negative things about this deck, but it is powerful. And it does some amazing things. It has a lot of cards that kind of slow the gameplay down. Uh, some stacks elements, but other things that just punish you for doing broken stuff. And I like that aspect. It's got a land tax in there, which goes very well with scroll rack. And so you can manipulate the top of your deck. It plays well off of constantly searching and shuffling. It's a fun deck to play. It does its thing every game. But here's the problem. I think I've won twice with it. And I've played the deck probably 20 times. The win percentage is very low. And it's not because the deck isn't powerful. It's because what the deck is trying to do looks more threatening than it actually is. The politics of this deck in the way that it is constructed does not allow it to be successful. So let's look at some of the detailed breakdowns of the decks. Go through some of the cards and see if we can really narrow in on what makes these decks so good and so bad when it comes to actually winning the game. I think when we talk about specific areas of deck construction, it's good to look at what was done well and what was done poorly, but today I want to focus only on what was done well. What makes this deck successful? what allows it to play at tables of mixed power levels and still come out on top. I think there's a lot of things in this deck that are unconventional and things that you might not consider when building your decks at home. There's a big focus on optimization and a big focus on looking at EDH rec and seeing which cards synergizes really well with your commander, which cards combine to make a CEDH level adjacent version of the deck, and I don't think that should always be the case. I think depending on the table that you're at, that can be a death sentence. Because looking like you're playing CEDH without the additional support cards to back it up makes you very fragile and prone to being shut down by the other three people at the table. I don't think all CEDH decks can be played one on three. Some of them can. And the instant win cards do instantly win, but when you have three people whose whole purpose is shutting you down, it's not always going to be a good time. This deck actually does really well in those sorts of games because everyone shuts down the CEDH player and I can pick up the remains. So I want to look through a couple of the different parts of this deck, a couple of the choices that were made, and talk about why this is successful. Why the politics here work when the politics here don't. And I think a lot of it comes down to the way that the structural power of the deck is built into the cards and mechanics that we play in a way that doesn't put it out there in front of the players. Our hand never gets particularly large. We're not drawing tons of cards. The lands in front of us don't ever become overwhelming. We're never getting up to 15, 16, 17 lands. And our graveyard only ever has a small smattering of big creatures in it. But that's enough to win the game. And a little advantage here and a little advantage there is enough to creep ahead of the rest of the table without setting off all the alarm bells. So let's look at the different packages in the deck and the different ways that we play the game that allow us to be so successful, and that allow us to have a win percentage probably well above where it should be. Come on over. All right, so let's walk through what Sapling of Kolfner really does. Now, it's indestructible, and I figure the best way to start this off is talk about how we have the lands set up in the deck, because I think this is a little bit unique for the way that we see a lot of modern EDH decks. Now the deck doesn't have a lot of cards that care about basic lands, 
but just because we don't care about any fancy lands, we're running a fairly large suite of almost 30 basic lands split between forests and swamps. We have a couple of cards that produce one color land on the non-basic side, and then only a handful of cards that allow us to get both of our colors with a few utility lands. The purpose of this is that we consistently hit one land every turn. Again, we're playing about 40 lands here, and we can usually hit our colors when we need them. Our commander doesn't care whether we have black or green mana, so any time we can get up to five is good enough to play her. Now, to assist us in getting our high mana cost things out, we do have a handful of cards that allow us to search for lands to consistently hit that curve, and a selection of cards that actually do put us ahead by either producing mana or searching for lands. Any combination of these cards will allow us to get to our seven, eight, nine mana costs as needed without really raising any red flags. So we can usually ramp unimpeded, get to the colors that we need when we need them, and late game we have a few cards like Elvish Aberration that can boost our mana significantly by bringing that back into play. Getting into the meat of the deck, one of the really important things that we are doing is keeping the board clear. Again, because we are so resilient to destruction effects, we are running a bunch on our own. And whether that blows up creatures or blows up everything else, we can survive most of those destruction effects and we want to lean into this clear the board strategy. Finally, finishing with a World Slayer acts as a combo with our commander clearing the entire board minus our indestructible cards, and so we can continue to attack over and over, clearing the board, preventing anybody from interacting with us, and ideally winning the game. With a couple of other indestructible creatures in play, we can get there a lot faster. Now, I think it's important that we talk about some of our graveyard interactions and what we're doing to try to play around with getting things into and out of the graveyard. We have a selection of cards that bring creatures and artifacts back from the graveyard, as well as some lands and other uh, cards as needed. Puppeteer's Click, notably, can pull from your opponent's graveyard. There's a handful of cards that work together to uh, keep our opponent's graveyard clear. This allows us to cast Twilight's Call, hitting primarily our own creatures and being able to cast it as an instant means that sometimes we can surprise our opponent by bringing our entire graveyard into play and then overwhelming them in one turn. Now I think it's time to talk value. Just good cards. We have Greaves, Genesis Wave, we have Diabolic Tutor, a handful of other cards to allow us to draw and search as needed. Mesmeric Orb puts things into the graveyard, but again, the graveyard acts as kind of a second hand for us. You'll note the Diabolic Tutor is bad, and I agree with that. Originally this was a Demonic Tutor, but I found that Demonic Tutor draws a lot of hate, and sometimes just casting Demonic Tutor is enough to make people try to push you out of the game. And finally, I think it's really important in a big Bring Creatures Back From The Graveyard deck to have big creatures to bring back from the graveyard. Something that I am a firm believer in when it comes to these graveyard strategies is having creatures that you can cast for their regular mana cost versus only being able to pull them out using graveyard effects. One of the things that I've run into before is having things all be very high mana cost and being trapped in your hand with you doing nothing because you have no discard outlet or way to bring them back from the graveyard. So having a few at three, four, five mana can be very important to actually getting your game plan going and being able to lean on your commander to get creatures off the top of the deck and then cast them that same turn. Ultimately, that makes up the majority of the deck and all of these things work together to search for the pieces that we need to end the game keep creatures alive during any sort of loop with World Breaker, remove troublesome non-creature permanents, and also just get creatures into play for free whenever possible. Together, the deck works really well to stabilize and recur everything that becomes a problem for us, and over the course of the game, we will occasionally find that we are bringing our creatures back three, four, five times, 
and just being able to overwhelm our opponent with those large creatures. So I hope that's been helpful. I hope there's a couple things that you can take from that description, from that strategy of building a deck, and apply that to your own deck construction. Maybe look at some of those CEDH cards, some of the ones that are really notorious, and maybe swap those out for something a little less scary. Maybe get your win percentage up a little bit, if that's what you want. You know, sometimes the fun is in playing the deck. The fun is doing the thing. Being that rattlesnake that really scares your opponents into taking you out first. And maybe that's your victory. Your victory is that you were scary enough that you had to be put down. That can be a lot of fun too. Playing Arch Enemy like that and seeing the other decks be successful against you can be a win all its own. But if you're trying to win, if you're trying to make a deck that sneaks under the radar and steals those wins more often than not, I hope this has given you something to think about. It's been nice talking to you.